Friday marks the second anniversary of the January 6th attacks, when a crowd of angry Trump supporters violently stormed the U.S. Capitol in an effort to prevent Congress from certifying Joe Biden's presidential election win. Stephen Sund was the chief of the Capitol Police that day, and he describes the events as the worst mass attack on law enforcement in his nearly 30-year-long career. He writes about that and more in his new book, Courage Under Fire, and he joins me now. Thanks so much for coming in. Appreciate Thanks for having me here today. And you write that January 6th was treated differently from a security standpoint than any other major event on Capitol Hill. Help us understand how, in what ways? So I look at that from the intelligence point of view. I've been in Washington, D.C., like, like you said, for close to 30 years. I've done ma many national special security events, some of the major events they have, major uh, demonstrations. And any event that has a threat stream, uh, even far less than what we saw now I know exists on January 6th, the FBI would do a number of things. Usually they call together an executive meeting where they pull together the chiefs to say, hey, we're seeing a lot of concerning rhetoric uh, online, a lot of concerning threats, or they do what's called a joint intelligence bulletin with DHS, or even a conference call with your um, local area chiefs to say this is what they're seeing. We saw none of this on January 6th. Well, in the book, you point to an alarming lack of coordination with other government agencies to include the FBI, DHS, even the intelligence unit within Capitol Police. And you say that they were aware, they had warnings about the far-right extremists, the Trump supporters who were readying for a violent attack, but yet that wasn't shared with you. What intelligence were you seeing? So the intelligence I was seeing was we had um, total four intelligence bulletins that were put up by my intelligence unit within um, the Capitol Police. You got to understand we're a consumer of intelligence. We don't have, we don't create our own intelligence, so we get it from the intelligence community. The first three all indicate no indication of uh, civil disobedience. It's all going to be like the um, previous MAGA-1 and MAGA-2. Uh, the fourth one comes up. And in, you mean the previous MAGA rallies? Yeah, in November, in, in December. Washington. I'm sorry, yeah. yes, the previous MAGA rallies in December. Uh, and the fourth one that's put out January 3rd, uh, late in the evening, uh, received on the 4th, uh, reviewed on the 4th, is 15 pages and has a final paragraph that talks about possibly people coming armed, possibly white supremacists and militia attending. The same things we saw in the previous MAGAs. Nothing about a coordinated attack on the Capitol. The very next day, the same intelligence unit puts out an intelligence product that says low probability of civil disobedience and demonstrations, and also recommends I approve the uh, permits for all the demonstrations on the Capitol grounds. So at that point, I see the same, same information on the 5th and on the 6th. So I'm not seeing the stuff that's coming up that's saying that we're going to have a coordinated attack on the Capitol. But we now know that intelligence existed. Well, in the book, you say that the Department of Homeland Security and the intelligence community watered down the intelligence. Was that a bureaucratic failing, as you see it, or was that intentional? So when I say they watered it down, it was a, a, a thought that this may be what happened. There's a lot of concern within the president's cabinet of the president um, invoking the Insurrection Act. If he felt that there was a big enough threat against the Capitol, and we now know that his secretary of defense and his joint ch uh, chairman of the joint chiefs of staff, Milley, both suspected there was going to be mass violence in Washington, D.C., so much so they talked about locking down the city, that if the president knew that could happen, that could give him the ammunition he needs to invoke the Insurrection Act. So there's a lot of people thinking that he was going to invoke the Insurrection Act and deploy the military around the Capitol. And I think that cascading effect just created failure after failure with the Department of Defense, possibly the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. You also write about the fact that, the, as you say, the Pentagon was concerned about the optics, that you had requested a National Guard assistance, but you were rebuked. That is correct. What people need to realize is on uh, January 6th, when we became under attack, uh, I reached out to all the law enforcement resources I possibly could. I called, I called in 17 law enforcement agencies, 1,700 officers to help us battle the, the riot that we were seeing. When the cops are overrun and out, outnumbered 58 to 1, when we dial 911, the last resort is the Department of Defense. Um, I called the Department of Defense to activate the defense support for civil authority. It should be an easy call. I've done it many, many times for other events but they have an emergency authority to immediately send me resources. What I didn't know was that two days before January uh, 6, Defense uh, Secretary Miller had put out this memo that restricted the very resources he could only suspect my, my guys would need on January 6 for the violence he knew was coming. Uh, civil disobedience resources, riot gear, riot control agents, uh, vests, helmets, things that his soldiers would need to give protection to my officers. And it took three and a half hours for them to arrive on the scene after my repeated begging with the Pentagon. They only arrived after, after the fighting was over. Is the suggestion then that this was all coordinated and that it was intentional to deprive you of the, of the security resources that you needed? Uh, I can tell you my repeated calls to the Pentagon, 
you know, I first had to deal with a 71 minute delay in getting approval from the Capitol Police Board to even call the, the National Guard. Then once I got that, my repeated calls to the uh, Pentagon begging and pleading for uh, my repeated pleas to, uh, for the uh, National Guard assistance, and them not sending it. When they're seeing the same images I'm seeing, I can only, I can only suspect they did not want to send them there. They weren't going to send them there no matter what. And Miller had actually said that. He said, there's no way I was going to deploy National Guard west of Ninth, uh, east of Ninth Street anywhere near the Capitol. I think he was afraid of the same thing, the Insurrection Act. In the book, you reveal that Pentagon officials at the time, as they were refusing your requests to deploy the National Guard, that they were sending security forces to protect the homes of high-ranking Pentagon officials and generals. Yeah, think, think about that. Again, they, they placed the look of the National Guard, the optics of them being on, national, on um, capital territory over the lives and safety of my officers who were being beaten. Yet, like you said, they deployed resources, security resources, to their own generals' homes. Um, that's, that's absurd. The day after the attack on the Capitol, um, you were forced out of your job. What do you make of your responsibility at the time and, and your assessment of, of how you handled that day and the lead up to it? When, when you look at everything that I tried to do on that day, on January 6th, with the particular circumstances that I faced, um, the fact I made dozens of calls to bring in the outside resources that actually turned the tide and uh, helped my officers win back the Capitol, uh, I did everything I could that day. One of the takeaways is you say that, uh, that this could happen again, that there aren't enough barriers, there isn't enough planning that could prevent another attack on the U.S. Capitol at this point. What, I, what I'm concerned about is really three or four things. One, the security structure on Capitol Hill is way too politicized. You have a police department with a chief that is supposed to be experienced in law enforcement that's overseen by three politically appointed people, that's overseen by four uh, oversight committees that all report to certain political parties within Congress. That's a recipe for disaster. That first has to be changed. The intelligence community has to be corrected. We can't have these, these issues on January 6th after September 11th, we created the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, to prevent this from happening. And Department of Defense has, not, has got to stop being politicized. They can't be worried about optics when the lives of members of Congress and the lives of my officers are at stake um, and refuse to send help. Stephen Sund, the book is Courage Under Fire. Thanks again for your time. Appreciate I appreciate it, sir. Thank you.